Hi everyone, Ollie here, welcome back to my series of cardiology tutorials. This is what an ECG, an electrocardiogram, looks like, and it's something that you'll be seeing all the time as a med student and as a doctor. In order to understand how to read one of these, however, we need to start with the basics and learn what all these different waves mean so we can build up to the big picture. I'd like to invite you to follow along with me as we go so we can build up a set of notes that will be useful for you. Today we're going to purely focus on the components of the ECG waveform and the important clinical features that you need to be aware of, so we'll cover the following learning objectives today. Gross structure of the ECG waveform, knowing how each of the wave components links it to activity within the heart muscle, understand the normal lengths and shapes for each wave component, and know some of the basic clinical correlates to ECG shape changes. So our typical ECG waveform looks something like this, flat line to small bump, down, big spike upwards, down again, back to the flat line, and then another two small bumps. So here's our ECG. I'll just label some of these really quickly and we can go through what each part means. The first bump is a P wave. This occurs when the left and right atria of the heart are full of blood and the sinoatrial node fires off. Both of our atria then depolarize, contract and pump blood into the ventricles. Normally this should be less than 100 milliseconds long. Be sure to check out the companion video on the cardiac myocyte action potential so you understand how this muscular contraction works. As you'll be aware, the signal then has to move from the sinoatrial node to the atrioventricular node, where the signal chain pauses briefly to allow the ventricles time to fill properly. Otherwise we'd get poor cardiac output. We measure this period from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of this next set of waves, which is called the PR interval, and it should last 120 to 200 milliseconds. This next set is collectively referred to as the QRS complex, which occurs when the heart muscle depolarizes and beats during systole. We come down as the AV node releases the signal down the interventricular septum, up again in the tall R wave as the left ventricle contracts, and then down in the S wave as the right ventricle contracts. The QRS complex should last 80 to 120 milliseconds. We then move on to the ST segment, the period in which the blood is actually pumped from the ventricles to the lungs and the rest of the body. This should always be flat in a normal person, and we'll come back to that in a moment. The important thing is that when our S wave reaches the isoelectric line again, the line from which positive and negative changes are measured in the middle, this is the J point, and we use it to decide if there are any shape changes relative to here. This first hump is the T wave, which signals the repolarization of the ventricles as they relax. Notice that it's not as round a bump as the P wave, it should actually be asymmetrical, with the upward slope being a bit more gradual than the downward slope. Something I want to quickly touch upon is the QT interval, the time from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave, which represents the sum time for ventricular depolarization and then repolarization again. We'll cover why this is important in a second, but it should be between 400 and 440 milliseconds. The last feature you might sometimes see is a U wave. It tends to be quite small, and we're not 100% sure why it happens. They're thought to represent repolarization of the Purkinje fibers, but because they're not always visible, it's uncommon to rely on them for regular practice. So there's our complete ECG wave. It follows the electric cardiac cycle and these waves repeat over and over ad infinitum. So now for the clinical stuff, returning to our P wave, any abnormal changes tend to be related to the sinoatrial node. If it's inverted and reflected upside down, this could mean that the heart is actually facing the other way, from right to left in a condition called dextrocardia, and therefore depolarization is happening in a different direction. It could also be sinoatrial block. If the SA node isn't firing properly and another part of the heart has then taken over as the pacemaker. A big P wave can indicate both hypokalemia, which is low potassium, and right atrial enlargement, and a small P wave might be due to hyperkalemia, or too much potassium. If you can't see these normal looking P waves, we need to consider atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, but we'll discuss those in another video. Moving on to the PR interval, it's really quite simple. If it's shorter than 120 milliseconds, this suggests that the ventricles are pre-excited by the existence of another conductive pathway within the heart muscle, and they're contracting before they should. This is most commonly something called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. 
If it's longer than 200 milliseconds, we need to be thinking about atrioventricular block, a problem with the normal conduction pathway between the atria and the ventricles. Now we're at ventricular contraction, the QRS complex, and once again we're only really concerned with if it's long or short. If it's more than 120 milliseconds, crucially we need to be thinking about bundle branch block, a problem with the conduction system in the middle of the heart, or indeed hyperkalemia, again too much potassium. If the amplitude of this complex is really big, this also could suggest cardiac hypertrophy, enlargement of the heart muscle which we might see in conditions like chronic hypertension or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The ST segment is maybe the most important section for medical students to know. You'll remember before that we said it really needs to be flat, and if it's elevated that's actually suggestive of damaged heart tissue as in myocardial infarction, a heart attack and this would suggest ST elevated myocardial infarction, or a STEMI. Equally, if it's depressed relative to the baseline, this is suggestive of tissue ischemia, lack of oxygen, and we call this non-ST elevated myocardial infarction, or, or N-STEMI. Lastly, the T waves, there are only three things to know about them. Inverted T waves are often associated with tissue ischemia, while flattened T waves are linked to hypokalemia, just like big P waves are. And the opposite, hyperkalemia, once more too much potassium, is classically associated with tall, tented T waves. Finally, we return to the QT interval. There are a few important things that can affect it. Some people have something called long QT syndrome, which can be carried genetically or acquired later, and the important thing is that it places you at higher risk of developing a cardiac arrhythmia. And lastly, certain medications such as beta blockers can cause a long QT, as can hypokalemia or hypothyroidism. So that's it guys, thank you very much for watching this video. I'd really appreciate any feedback you can give me, and the way to do that is using the form that's linked in the video description, and if you do that, you'll unlock a free revision pack including an Anki flashcard deck and a revision poster. It helps me improve the videos for next time, and you can tell me what content you'd like to see here on the channel. And of course it helps me out with my teaching portfolio and makes me a better teacher, which is something I'm really passionate about. So thanks for watching guys, if you'd like to support the channel there are three ways to do it. First is like, share and subscribe. The second is you can donate a coffee to me, which keeps me going through the editing of these videos using my Ko-Fi link, or you can use my referral link for Complete Anatomy 2020 to save 10% off your first year's subscription, and I'll get a small kickback from that as well. Take care guys, and I'll see you next time.